Hey everybody, Larry Lawton here again with a great review today. Today our review is Gravesend. Before I get started, make sure you check out our merch out. Make sure you check out our member program on Patreon and YouTube. And also, listen, make sure you go see this show on Amazon Prime. It's called Gravesend. It reminded me of me and all you guys want to hear my stories. Here it is. Another guy did it. I got to meet the creator, the director, and the star of the show. But today, right now, first up, you're going to hear from William DeMio right now. William, welcome to my show. Hey, Larry. It's great to be on your show. I've seen all the great things you're doing, and it's it's an honor to be on the show. I'm very happy to be here tonight, buddy. Well, thank you for that. But here, we're going to tell everybody about the show, Gravesend, because and when I say it reminded me, it's in the 80s, it's the mob life. And his characters. Well, obviously, I got to follow your character. Where did you come up with Benny? And and where did you come up with even the last names? Benny, you know, Benny's last name, Zaretta. Is that how you yeah, pronounce ben, it? Benny Zaretta. They call him Benny Z. Well, you, how did you come up with that? Well, you know what it is, buddy? There's so many, as you know, there's so many guys that have so many different nicknames and everything like that. Almost everybody has... Crazy Larry. Yeah, there's always <laughs> someone with with a, with a nickname, and I tried to give all these guys different nicknames that I thought could work. You know, I've been making a lot of different movies. Uh, you know about you know Italians in Brooklyn, and I've been I'm running out of names too. Uh, <laughs> and I just thought Benny would be a pretty cool name for the lead the lead character. Let me tell you what hit me off the bat. Spumoni Gardens, Third oh, Avenue. I met my first wife, Rosen, on Third Avenue in a club back in 1986. So, I mean, everything you're doing, is, you know, it's a timepiece, which is not easy. But I will tell you what, you're hitting it on a bank. Now, Gravesend has Benny, and he followed. He's a mob guy who's in a mob family, and he's really an up-and-coming guy. And he's got, a, you know, he's got his rabbi, as we used to call him, and he's got his crew. And I got to ask about a couple of the scenes. Of course... The great cliffhanger, which every show has, is the ending. I mean, I want to see more. I mean, that was a great... What church did you film in? Because, you know, I'm from the neighborhood. I was married on 65th Street. I was married in Regina Pache's. Uh, my my uh, wedding was Oriental Manor on 18th Avenue and 86th Street, you know, in a mob place. And, you know, this this place... Every, every time I look at something, I go, where is that? What church was that? A Lady of Grace Church. Yeah, that was the church that I actually went to school at. That's, that's, you know, the priest in the church. I mean, Father Catron is a, a priest. That's, he's 91 years old, one of my dearest friends. He's, uh, he's retired, but he's still part of the church. And Father Vincent Chicharilla, they, they let me shoot in the church. Uh, and it was an honor to film there because that's that's my neighborhood. That's the, that's my church. That's my parish. Wow. You know, I lived on 79th Street, 23rd Avenue, just off Stillwell Avenue, coming up to the home stretch. And uh, people all know my book from the book that all those places I describe in my book, you guys are going to see right here on Gravesend. So let's get into a couple of the episodes. When you sat down and started really getting into this second episode... When it gets more into the meat, you got your crew and you're having another beef with another crew. I think it was the second episode. And you kind of, you're, you you really reminded me a lot of myself because I was a cowboy, you know, and I, I had balls of steel, big balls, didn't give a shit, but I was respected, knew the game. But man, you know, I, I felt like at any time I could go off. How did you come up with that? Like, and how did you, uh, obviously you'd come up with it because this is where you grew up. Everybody yeah. in this neighborhood know, knows about this. But tell the people how it really goes. And when you put it together, did you step on any toes in New York? Well, the, th the thing is, is that I felt like when I was even telling the story that it was good that the, the main character wasn't a boss, um, was was a made guy, but wasn't a higher level guy. It was a worker. I've, Let's face yeah, it, I used yeah, to you know, earn it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and and people don't understand, like, like you know, there's a lot of, there's guys, you know, and as you know, that are in the life, that they don't even get their butt until they're in their 60s sometimes. The butt means being a made guy up, everybody out there. And that, in the mob life, is is because when you run a crew and you're in the family, you get you get made, as they call it, but it's, you really, like he's saying, get your button. You know, instead of seeing, like, Tony Soprano, who is, like, supposedly going to be the boss... 
uh, that you've seen more of a, of a guy coming up, uh, not from the bottom, but like right in the middle and all the stuff that he had to deal with between the people that were below him, his associates, all the people in his crew, and then the people that are above him, his captain, which James Russo plays the character Crazy Chris, uh, and then the people above Crazy Chris, and just all the different conflicts with the other families and just different things, you know. It, it, it's it's so well done, Will, Will, uh, William. And Thank here's you. a scene that I loved. Uh, one of the scenes was when, you know, you got real pissed that one of your crew had a fight in a club, and boy, you know, boy, did that remind me over the clubs, all the clubs in New York we used to go out to in the 80s. It was just like that. And we used to go on another person's turf. And I was told by my boss, he'd say, man, listen, don't go over there. We can't help you over there. Don't you get in trouble. And it was so funny because in one of the scenes, you still stuck up for your crew because that's what I used to do. Yeah, and yeah, what yeah. you did, you got, you, when you came back, and, and, and even I, I think it was uh, Leo or his character, Mikey the Hat, said, you want me to take care of this? That scene was great because it's so true. He can't control himself. He makes you look bad. And exactly. you, you took care of that. Yeah, and the thing is, is that if you remember, like you said, you grew up in the neighborhood, like in these places, like for instance, like, you know, a place called like Pastels in Bay, oh in Bay Ridge. God. Like these Third are, Avenue. There's a lot of tes high testosterone running around the neighborhood and, and people, it was very easy to get into a fight. There was <laughs> fights that broke out all the time, you know, even in the diners. I mean, think about this. When you went to the Vegas diner, which everyone went there after they went out, <laughs> Think about this for a second. There was bouncers in a <laughs> diner. Like, think, like, try to realize this. A diner where you were eating had bouncers oh. because of the problems that would happen. People would be drunk after this. You're, you're looking at my girl, this, that. Fights would break out in a diner. A guy got, a, as a matter of fact, one of the bouncers got killed and stabbed in the diner years ago. That neighborhood was insane with the way it was back then. And that's why I wanted to make this story about Gravesend, about the neighborhood, just just how it was, Bensonhurst, Gravesend, Bay Ridge, that whole area. Another great scene blew me away. The, the, the jerk, but boy, I wanted, I wanted you to kill him. The dude who spat, spit your food. What a great scene. And you went I back know. and out, because you know, it was so funny. How the girls knew what we did, but didn't know what we did. Oh, damn. I think I left my beeper in there. I'll go back in and get it for you. No, sweetie. It's okay. Exactly. They kind of always, they, you know, because they're around the life. Their dad, their uncle, who's in the joint, who's away, whose uncle, you know, uh, hey, they know he's riding around in a Cadillac. He never has money. He's the guy. Hey, they're placing bets with him. And all of a sudden, you know, they're part of family. So, but they know, but they don't know the deep end. And you showed that such a way by going back out so, oh I forgot my beep I forgot my beeper I tell the story in one of my scenes about a guy that worked for me I had two rules if you didn't answer your beeper you either better be dead or in jail and he didn't answer his beeper on me and I had a clubhouse and I I come home it was about four in the morning and I took out a 357 and I threw three shots right next to his head boom 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 he comes flying off that bed, almost crying, thinking I was going to kill him. And boy, to this day, I still know these guys, of course. And he tells these story, man, Larry had one rule. You know, and he he learned those rules because I was tested myself. You know, I couldn't have been a made man. I never was, but I was a big earner. I made a lot of people a lot of money. And when I was doing very well in Florida, and a guy, you know, calls me up and says, Hey, Larry, uh, we need you here. I didn't say why, when. Got on the next plane, and I was in Brooklyn. Remember my way cab service? They picked me up. We had that cab service. They picked me up at the airport. A guy gave me a piece, gun, put it in, and I'm cursing the whole way. Fucking Belt Parkway. It's, it's, it's dark traffic, the trash, and I'm coming from Florida. <laughs> this guy's thinking this guy was going to kill me or something. And I came back, and I played cards. Played cards. Because you made the scenes with the cards and the gin. And my boss was so rich, and he's bitching about losing a $20 hand to gin, and you made these scenes that are just so on point. So how did you come up with that scene with the diner? I mean, did something happen in your life that, that made you think that was a great scene? Well, as a writer, you try to find different angles, and the thing with when you make something with the mafia, uh, people 
and the critics, they always try and and critique in a way where like you're biting off Martin Scorsese, it's another Goodfellas, it's another the thing is is that Casino or something, yeah. When you Yes, well, all these movies, like these characters are a certain way. You can't change the way they are because then you'll make them into cartoon characters. You gotta make them be real. So you gotta try and find which and being real means they're gonna be similar to, you know, Jimmy Burke in in uh, in uh, Goodfellas, or similar to Tony Soprano, or similar to Paulie Walnuts. You can't make them, they're all gonna be similar types. You just gotta kind of find different angles and different ways and different stories to try and make it a little interesting. I just felt like that that particular scene, how I created it and how, you know, the stupid waiter that actually was jealous of all these mob guys because they had all these pretty women and how they had the money and how, and he just was a frustrated waiter and he just, you know, get, spits on great, his food. Great and, scene, and, everybody. You gotta check this scene out. I'll give you another thing. Here's another question my audience is gonna want. How did you do the casting? I mean, are they neighborhood guys? Because I don't see many big names. There's big names. There's uh, Totoro and there's a couple other guys I see that, you know, I see in movies and people will recognize. I mean, it's not De Niro in the movie uh, show. But there's big guys who played a lot of scenes in a lot of movies. How did you get these guys? I mean, you know, obviously it's not easy. So being that I've been doing this for so long uh, as an actor and, and just being in the industry for many years, I've rubbed elbows with so many different actors and a lot of Italian-American actors and actors who have been in many of these type of movies just from working on different sets and stuff like that. And when I was directing, I felt like... I needed to find all the guys I knew I wouldn't have to second guess. Guys yeah. who you've seen in many of these movies, you, you know them, you've seen them, but none of them were really big stars. They were all well known, but there's no like major, major stars. If you think about The Sopranos, for instance, all the whole cast was not very well known. They, you've seen them around, all of them. And then when the show took 100%. off- 100%. Yeah, when 100%. the show took off, they became much more well known. I, I uh, think that's going to happen to your crew. Uh, your crew, look at me. You're bringing me back. I really think it's going to happen to your show because obviously you got to have more. You know, more more of these uh, episodes in the hopper. And and I foresee this thing going for many seasons if you can keep this creative mind of yours going. Because I'll tell you what, right now what I'm seeing is not only guys like me who know the game uh, can see it, but. Look at my, my base. My fans are all over the world and they love it. And from my book to what I talk about is what you're doing. And I just love it. And, I, and I, you got to make and obviously stay ahead of that curve where it doesn't get boring or, of or you know, fall away. And somebody say, you know, I don't want to watch this anymore. Because I wanted to watch every episode. Yes, I'm a little vested because I live there. And all my fans who want to know where I grew up... You're going to see it right here. This is the second half of my life. I grew up in the Bronx, and then I moved. We moved up in the world, like big deal. You know, we went to Brooklyn. But then usually the Brooklyn crew, and you know this, they go to the Guinea Gangplank, and they go across to Staten Island. Yeah. But the crew, the hardcore crew, the guys who hung out, the guys who were in the bar every day, hustling to make money, hustling to do everything. And I, I, every scene I see, I say, that's it. He nailed it. He nailed it. I'm waiting for the guy with the hot goods to come up, open the trunk, and you're going to see the underwear and the, and the sweatsuits. And everything you're doing is, is like, on point. So how, how are you doing this? Do you have other writers with you, or is it all you? Well, right now, I mean, I wrote the first four, and I have a lot more written. And, you like, I have it where you're just going to keep wanting more. And, and you're right. You don't want a show to get stale. Uh, which happens with a lot of shows. But like, as you said, just from our neighborhood, there's so many stories yeah. to tell, you know, between the 4th of July and, uh, you know, all of the swag, like you said, just the different neighborhoods, the different people, the Hasidic Jews in Borough Park. I mean, think about think about years ago, that whole <laughs> race thing that happened between uh, the African-Americans. walking down 18th yes. Avenue. There's that one. There's the one between the Hasidic Jews and the Crown Heights incident. Yep. Do you remember that incident? Absolutely. There's a lot Absolutely. of stuff that happened in the 80s. There's a lot of places to go with this. Uh, I'm waiting for some more with the... Uh, 
Obviously, in the eighties, the graffiti was sometimes pretty big. You know, graffiti. the trains and you know going down. And obviously, the Wall Street. You know, there's the guys on Wall Street. We have mob on Wall Street. All stuff. I was in the joint with all those guys. Hang guys out windows. A whole bunch of stuff. So you got a lot of great storylines coming. I know that. I'm sure you do. And uh, are you getting more and more people wanting to come on the show? You, you said to me, maybe oh, I'll I come mean, on the show. Yeah, I mean, I want to do some episodes. Yeah, I mean, we already have we already have at least you know four new people, five new people already that are pretty well known that are that are coming aboard. Well known people you've 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 seen in many many shows and movies, uh, and that's building as we speak. Uh, very well known people. And there's more. Can story you give anything more. to my audience away? Yeah, I mean, well, yeah, a couple of people like Chuck Zito is definitely coming aboard. Oh, Chuck Zito, tough. Yeah, and, uh, tough, tough. I remember when he had a fight with uh, Chris Pacello. You remember Chris? Yeah, well, he had you a know. fight. With, well, well, Chuck Zito had a fight with a lot of people. Yeah, yeah that's true. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Chuck, Chuck's a great guy. Chuck's a, a good friend of mine, and he's a really good actor. He's done so many, you know, he's been in so many movies. and you know. To let my to, audience know, Chuck yeah. Zito is a hell's angel and a, a true life badass. Trust me, true life badass. I'm sure you're going to have prison scenes and I'm going to show you're going to oh, have yeah. different things. Guys getting in and out. And, oh, and yeah, I all just, of that. You know, all of that. Yeah, you, you know, you listen, like you said, you know, the thing about, about Gravesend is that it's Brooklyn. I mean, Brooklyn, like everyone that follows the mob, and there's so many people that are so fascinated with the Italian mafia, it's all over. In the, in the United States of America, the, there's no place around, there's no place in the United States that had more mobsters than Brooklyn. We, me and you, as you know, we could probably sit here and name 100 people right off the top that are very well-known mob figures. So. Brooklyn is Brooklyn. Hey, 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 William, you're going to laugh at this. When I got out of the joint in 07, there was a list of 200 people I wasn't allowed wow. to associate with. 200 people. You want to know the truth? I knew about 50. You know, that I knew very well. That I, if I saw them, you know, I knew the names of those other guys. But there was 200 guys. And that's just right there. I'm not talking Brooklyn. I'm talking, there's another exactly. 500. No, I, exactly. You know what I'm saying. And the, you know? just the whole thing about Brooklyn, you know, between the, the history of Coney Island, how great Coney, the, Coney Island, the trains, the grittiness, the graffiti, the boom box, the old school music, the gambling, the gambling the all the gambling, gambling we joints, the gambling joints, people on the phones talking with all the bookie business, how it was in the 80s when it wasn't overseas. There's so much going on. The Verrazano Bridge, the Belt Parkway. There's Listen, no computers. Exactly. No computers. No. I, I, we, used to, we used to have court, well, dimes when I grew up and getting into the, to the phones in the 70s. We're getting on the phones, trying to hit the dimes to call sports phone, calling 10, 10 wins, going on the radio That's every crazy. 22 minutes. You know you all, yeah, you know school. all that. And, and even the, the cars, like look at the great cars we have in the show. And you know, those old Cadillacs, the Buick Grand National. My, my friend Ronnie burned for insurance. He burned his Eldorado Barretts after we won it. Gambling with the book, he buys a, a $20,000 Eldorado Barretts with the white interior. I'll never forget his father. Oh, those are the best. Well, the, well, Connected yeah, the to, character Tommaso know. plays Benny's driver. That he's driving an '84 Eldorado convertible. I, I, it, it blew me. It blew me. I think this was a '77, '78. That's Barizzi the big one. Yeah, that's the when big it, one. Yeah, it it, it blew that's me away. One. When can we see the next shows? Do you know? Is there any time frame? I know. You know, well, we, right, we well, hate that delay. Yeah. Well, the, the problem is right now is the coronavirus. Obviously, is yeah. the problem that's delaying everything because. Absolutely. You know, we're, we're, we're getting, you know, we're, we have a lot of meetings set up and getting back into production and, and this delayed a lot of, you know, time because of what's going on with the coronavirus and hope, you know, hopefully we can film again soon. We would like them to probably come out at some point towards the end of this year, uh, hopefully, uh, based on, like I said, because we still have to shoot. Sure. Uh, you know, these first four was, was kind of like a test. They were done independently. We did them for like a very reasonable budget, and now we're stepping it up more, uh, and we're, we have more content and you know more storyline. How how long for my audience and give them? I think since we got a guy who's actually everything at the show, how long does it take you to film a show? Just production wise to shoot all four episodes. 
The shooting time took like about two months to get the four episodes done. Uh, is that editing too? No, then the post-production process is then another, you know, f five to six months when you finish that, that, everything. That's the big one. And yeah, you get yeah, all the rights one. to the music and you do your sound mix and you do your color correction. People don't realize what goes into this. Absolutely. You know, we're going to cut it and have a great day. And I'll tell you what, really, William, it's been a pleasure talking to you. We're going to be doing this more. You need anything from us here uh, on my channel and my fans, they're going to love Thank it. Thank you. Check them out, everybody. Thank you. And, Make and Larry, sure you I just want to say this, buddy. It's amazing how you turned your life around and all the good things you're doing and the positive energy you give to people and how you're trying to keep people out of trouble, how you're there for people. I want to say, you know, you, you know, I'm a fan of you. Uh, it's really great. And it also shows how people can get second chances and people don't give excuses. There's no, you, you, when you came out, there's no excuse. Oh, I was in the joint. Oh, I got this. So, no excuses. You're doing something. You, that's what I, I can't say enough great things about you. You're great. You're Thank a great you. role model to show people that we look, we all make mistakes in life. People give other people a chance too. It's like some people don't want to give people a chance. Your son is 20 or whatever, 22. Yes. When they're 22, they think they know it all. When they hit 30, they look back and go, man, I didn't know anything. When they hit 40, they look back and say, man, I still didn't know shit. Wait till they hit 50. I'm 58. I'll be 59 God here. Bless you, bro. And I say, man, I'm still learning. I'm We're still, all still learning. learning, bro. But people change, you know. And thank you very much for those kind words. You know, we all change. I love your story. I really do. And I want everybody to understand. Go check this out. You, you're not going to go wrong. You're going to love it. You're going to want you. more, just I, like me. And you're God bless everybody. And I hope we all, we're all going to get through this coronavirus thing. Everyone keep safe. Prayers for everyone. All positive vibes out there for everyone. God bless. Thank you so much. Amen. Have a great day. And, and by best of your family, everybody, you heard it right here. We have William DeMeo, who's the director, the star creator of a great show out there, Gravesend, on Amazon Prime. Make sure you check it out and make sure you hit us back, you know, because I always answer a lot of emails and my team is great with that. Thanks, everybody. God bless. Stay safe. Much respect.